Welcome, Philippe. Good evening and uh, welcome or bienvenidos, friends of the Hispanic Society, to what is the third installment of Las Tertulias de Arte Hispano or Hispanic Art Gatherings. Thank you once again to our members who have joined uh, monthly, actually, for almost a year. And welcome to all those who are tuning in for the first time. We continue these conversations on the first Tuesday of each month, of each month at 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. If you are not a member yet, please do consider joining by going to our website. It's hispanicsociety.org and search for membership and, of course, support. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking once again with the Hispanic Society's Collections Manager and Objects Conservator, Monica Katz. Monica will discuss a part of the collection that many of you tonight may not be familiar with, lacquerware from Latin America. Monica has been an objects conservator at the Hispanic Society for almost two decades. She is currently responsible for the treatments of objects from ceramics to woods, lacquers, ivories, also textiles. She was recently appointed collections manager and as such, she has been the coordinator for our traveling exhibition. She has been studying South American lacquers for two decades and given presentations in many places, including the Society of American Archaeology and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Most recently, she published an article with the Metropolitan Scientists, uh, Frederica Pozzi and Elena uh, Basso, that was based on materials analysis of one of our Barnith de Pasto objects, which we may see tonight, not sure. She has degrees from London School of Economics and began her career as an investment banker. And uh, she also has a degree from the Fashion Institute of Technology. After Monica's presentation, we will have a brief conversations and we invite you to join us afterward by submitting your questions in the comments section. You may submit your questions, by the way, or your comments at any point during the discussion. So thank you all for being with us. And Monica, please go ahead with lacquers. Thank you, Philippe, um, and thank you, Christina. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen now. Desktop two. I hope that worked. Do you all see? Perfect. Excellent. Um, so uh, good evening, everybody. Um, this evening, I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, just hold on just one second. This evening, I'm going to talk to you about the Hispanic Society's small but very fine collection of viceregal, uh, viceregal Latin American lacquered objects, some of which are shown here in this slide. These objects were made in the 17th and 18th century in Mexico and Colombia by indigenous and largely anonymous artisans, made for a European aesthetic and imitating Asian lacquer. As you will see, they incorporate European, Asian, as well as local elements in their decoration and demonstrate the extraordinary craftsmanship and artistic talent of the artisans who made them. Before I talk about the objects in our collection, I thought I'd say a few words about the term lacquer. Lacquer is one of those words that means different things at different times to different cultures. And so I thought it might be helpful to define some terms. So I went to the Oxford English Dictionary and this is the definition, a liquid made of shellac dissolved in alcohol or also of synthetic substances now, that dries to form a hard protective coating. And that basically describes modern car paint and all sorts of varnishes. Or, uh, and this is possibly the definition we're probably most familiar with, the sap from a lacquer tree used as a varnish. And that is what Asian lacquers are. Um, they are not, however, what the Hispanic society objects are made of, but the terms used to describe them in Spanish come from the same roots. Here you see uh, the 16th century, from the 16th century lac, which is an obsolete French lacre for sealing wax, 
Portuguese laka, the Hindi lak, Persian lak. Lacquered objects in Asia have been found dating back millennia and were highly prized. The lacquer tree that gives us Urushi lacquer and is used to decorate objects in China and Japan is called Toxicodendrum bernicifluum. It is indigenous to both countries, although there's a, there seems to be quite a bit of debate about where it originated first and how long ago. But we do know at least from the Shang dynasty in China, which is the second millennium BCE. Lacquer in Korea followed, and then in Thailand, Vietnam, and Burma, uh, there was a different lacquer tree that produced a, a softer lacquer called Thitsil. Lacquer from where from Japan started arriving in Europe in the second half of the 16th century, brought first by the Portuguese once the sea route to the east was discovered in 1497 by Vasco da Gama, and then by the Dutch. So lacquered objects were sought after because of their rarity, their otherness, their beautiful smooth finish, and their reflective qualities. By the 1640s and around the time the earlier of the Hispanic society objects were made, Portugal had been importing lacquer made to order, specifically for European tastes, the so-called Namban lacquer. Namban, which literally means for the Southern Barbarian. So what were artisans in the viceregal period in Mexico and Colombia trying to imitate? So I wanted to show you a few objects here. Uh, these two are both from the collection in the Met Metropolitan Museum, and they're both from the 15th century. The box at the top here is uh, from Japan, and it, um, it uses this technique called makie, uh, which is this, these gold sparkles on a black lacquer ground. Um, and in this rather beautiful red lacquer box with pennies on it from China, again, 15th century, I want you to pay attention to the fact that the um, flowers are carved into, carved into the surface, and so they appear in relief. These two objects from a, a little later are in the Victorian Albert Museum's collection. The um, object on the top is actually a Namban lacquer piece, one of the, those pieces that uh, was imported by the Portuguese. And here I want uh, you to pay attention to the fact that the decoration is framed by these uh, rectangle, by these um, geometric uh, borders uh, around each panel. And this I had to add because it's one of my favorite uh, export lacquer pieces. It's the Mazarin chest also at the V&A. Uh, this was actually imported by the Dutch and not the Portuguese, um, but it also has this framing technique around its panel. So tonight I'm going to talk about two traditions, Mexican lacquer or el maque and banista pasto from Colombia. Both decorative techniques are pre-Hispanic and evolved in response to the need to make gourds and other wooden objects waterproof long before other type, either type of lacquer became a prized decorative process. These objects from our collection are actually all de decorated um, with Mexican lacquer. And I also wanted to point out that maque, the word for uh, in uh, Spanish for Mexican lacquer is also believed to be derived from maquille, uh, the Japanese word, word for that special technique we saw earlier. So Mexican lacquer was made from coccosaxin, the small scale insect on the left. The insect was cultivated on acacias, pinyon pines and hog palms. They were harvested and then they were boiled for their fat, which rose, uh, and apparently it's quite malodorous, to the surface of boiling water. And it is commonly known as ahe. This was mixed with chia oil, um, which uh, is made uh, from the crushed and roasted seeds of a local sage plant shown here, um, or it's believed from the seeds of chicalote, a Mexican poppy. In, in order to make a paste from these two materials, fillers were added, including uh, volcanic ash, pozzolana, and in some cases, mineral clays, which are described as dolomite in the text, and colored using local pigments. Until 1983 and the discovery of lacquered objects in a Mistec burial site, which is 1200 to 1500 CE, our main evidence of pre-Hispanic 
lacquer were manuscripts from the early 16th century, which mention what are likely to be lacquered objects. On the left, you see the Matricola de Tributos from the second quarter of the 16th century, which recounts how subjugated towns had to provide hikaras or gourds as tributes to the conquering city states. On the right, this page from Relacion de Michoacán from about 1541, which shows a pictograph of a priest with a lacquered calabata or large gourd right here on his back, underlining the ritual importance and value of, the, of these decorated objects. And we know about the locally sourced pigments uh, they used from a 1547 description of a gourd cellar. Mineral clays or saffron root were used for yellows, mangrove bark for blue, Brazil wood, mineral clays or cochineal for red, and charred corn cob husks or guava tree branches for black. By the 17th century though, production and design of lacquered objects had shifted in response to Spanish demand and taste. New forms were introduced from Spain, the batea or tray and the bagueño or portable desk, as well as various chests, coffers and other furniture, which showed both the influences of European and Asian designs. Production of Mexican lacquer in the viceregal period was centered in the towns of Periban and Pátzcuaro, both in the state of Michoacán, and the town of Olinala in the neighboring state of Guerrero. Although they each used a combination of the same basic ingredients, each area of production had different techniques. I've also put on this map uh, the site, Siltepec, which is the Mistec burial site where the uh, prehistoric lacquer was shown. So this is a batea and it's um, made with decorated periban lacquer, which is the earliest of these techniques. It comes, it, it's the first half of the 17th century. It has a limited palette of red, yellow, orange, blue, green, and white on a black ground. The paste is made of ahe, chia oil, a filler and black pigment, and it's applied to the wooden substrate. The design is created by removing the black ground and inlaying different colored lacquers in the space revealed. It's possible to see score marks under magnification in some of the areas of loss, sort of here and around here. So this patea has a mixture of European and local imagery, again, on the black ground, which of course is the color we think of most readily when we think of Asian lacquer. So in this central cartouche, for example, we have a depiction of a seated European goddess, possibly Diana or Sibele. The area surrounding the central cartouche is crowded with a variety of figures, animals and plants, both real and fantastic. There are horses and unicorns, pigs and armadillos, of course, no armadillos in Spain, sheep and lions, birds and butterflies, Spanish nobles on horseback, horses drawing hay carts, men in what could be Chinese robes, winged reptiles, and two ornate tiered fountains that have these great shadow monkeys on their upper tiers spewing water. The back is also decorated, although much more simply. There are four roundels around the rim, which have European style figures in them, but the central circular lace-like design is really reminiscent of the decoration on pre-colonial work. The objects that come from Pat Square, like this writing desk and table stand are later and are manufactured with a different technique. While the ground is lacquer, it can vary in color from black to orange to pale blue and cream. The decoration here, however, rather than being inlaid into excised areas, is painted directly onto the lacquer layer. The palettes are much broader and incorporate gold paint as well as metal leaf, and the technique lends itself to more sophisticated depictions. These later objects tend to have a far more European feel, with clearer influences from lacquered objects of Asia and the Japaned objects of Europe. Made in circa 1760 by Jose Manuel de la Seda, who was the only artisan whose workshop was named in the period. This is an excellent example of the finest Patsquara lacquer and painting techniques. It's currently on loan to the Met and part of their crossroads exhibit. And it is the largest and most significant of all our lacquered objects. 
It's decorated with images of golden weeping willows, flowering plums, pagoda-like buildings and cranes. And I just note here that how these weeping willows are depicted are absolutely gorgeous. And the figures are soldiers and turbaned men doing battle. So this work seems even closer to the Chinoiserie-inspired Japan furniture being in, produced in Europe and North America in this period. And this is an image um, of the exhibition made in the Americas, which was in the MFA Boston in 2015, where they displayed our writing cabinet here next to Japan furniture uh, that was being produced in similar periods. Both the table and the cabinet were ordered substantially before they were decorated. As you can see from the x-ray, the lid was originally drop leaf and the sl slides, which are the pull out uh, pieces of wood that were to hold the drop leaf when it was down, um, were nailed in place. The table's back legs were reoriented so it could stand comfortably against a wall. Two types of wood are used in its construction, a, a different they're of different thicknesses and some boards are clearly reused from other pieces of furniture. All of this highlights that what is important and what was prized about this object is not the construction of the furniture itself, but its decoration, which in this case was considered so significant that Della Seda even signed it. So now I'm going to talk about the other uh, tradition um, the, in the Americas, Banista Pasto, that comes from uh, Colombia. Um, Banista Pasto is a tradition which produced equally beautiful and sophisticated decorated wooden objects. Uh, like some of these are some details from our objects in the collection. So the tradition stretches from Pasto in Colombia to Quito in Ecuador and produced largely European form objects in the viceregal period decorated with resin in a variety of techniques. The resin comes from a tree called Elogia pastoensis mora, which is a plant that is native to tropical rainforests in the upper Andes and is commonly known as mopa mopa. We used to think that Bernista pasto evolved from the production of caros, um, and this is a group of caros that um, are at the um, National Museum of the American Indian, uh, the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Uh, caros are ritual cups made in pairs um, for made in pairs for drinking chiche or maize beer. They're made of wood. Uh, the early ones are decorated with incised linear patterns and carved low relief, low relief geometric designs, like these ones. Hit this one here, um, and um, later on, in later examples, their, their designs become figural and they're filled with an opaque colored resin believed to be mopa mopa. Um, so the theory had a few issues. The first was that there was 2000 miles between the production centers of the Caros and Pasto in Colombia. And the second was that technically the two techniques seem to have very little in common. And even to the naked eye, the uh, aged resins on the two types of objects looked very different. The resin applied to Keros seems quite brittle. Um, it has a distinctive crackle or a pattern, while the resin on the Bernista Pasto pieces seem to retain significantly more, significantly more elasticity so that the whole wooden surface, both inside and out, was typically covered in resin. For example, like this gourd. Uh, which was the subject of the uh, research I did at the Met. Um, so a conservation scientist at the MFA Boston, Richard Newman, compared the resin from a group of Keros um, and from vice regal Banista Pasto objects, and he was actually able to differentiate between our species, Elegi pastoensis mora, and another related species, Elegi utilis, another plant from the, in the same region that produces significant amounts of resin. So all of the Keros had Elegi utilis, and all of the Banista Pasto pieces are, are decorated with Elegi pastoensis. So like in Mexico, the archaeological record in Colombia is sparse, and it was actually limited to some resin beads uh, that have been found in burial sites. And just like in Mexico, we have some early chronicles that tell us about these techniques. 
um, and in this case, a 1582 account that described the colored staffs made by the people of Timana, which is a town that is about 30 miles away from the archaeological finds of resin beads. So how is that de Gord decorated? So in 2012, I went to Pasto in Colombia, and um, the images on this slide explain the present day process, which has changed little since the Hispanic Society of Gord, Gord was made. Uh, the resin is the plant's protective coating for its young leaf shoots. It's found for a four day hike from Pasto. It was collected twice a year and formed into cakes that contained bark and other plant material. And once in pasto, it was cleaned of plant debris by repeatedly boiling. And then it's chewed to soften it and regain elasticity and then colored before being stretched into onion skin thin sheets using both teeth and hands. The stretched resin then has to be applied to a substrate. So this engraving from a 1879 French world tour guide next to my 2012 photo shows how important uh, heat is to the process. And Barnista Pasto artisans have to work terribly quickly, making the intricacy of these designs all the more remarkable and the randomness of details much less likely. So decorative elements were cut out of the thinnest part of these sheets and applied with heat directly to the substrate. So there are two types of decorative technique that were being produced in this period. Um, and they seem to develop contemporaneously. There is matte banis and brillante banis. Matte banis objects like this little coffer, um, they, for, to create these effects, they saturated the resin which is in its natural state, a sort of translucent palish green color. They saturated the resin with pigments until it was opaque and they drew it into thin sheets and made the designs by inlaying or overlaying different colors and shapes into the excised areas. For Barnis Briante, the artist used the color, used the color resin as tinted glazes layered over silver leaf or to build up color or design elements. This Barnis Briante box is one of the few Barnis de Pasto objects that we can date with some accuracy and we can date it to 1684. And the reason for this is it was commissioned by the Bishop of Popayan, Cristobal de Quiros, who died in 1684. And he had it made as a gift to his brother, Gabriel de Quiros, when he was appointed Marquez de Monreal by Charles II in December of 1683. So we know there wasn't much time for this to be um, for this to be commissioned and made. Both the construction of the writing box, it says exterior, and the decoration show Asian elements. Uh, replacing the classic Asian motif of a grapevine with squirrels is this trellis up here of passion fruit vines interspersed with birds and monkeys. And just as a, and because this is because I'm a conservator, I wanted to point this out to you, that in this particular box, you can see that when the original precious metal hardware was replaced with these modern brass hinges, um, the box and the losses were repaired. I don't know if you can see this line that I'm tracing. Whoops, sorry, go back to that line that I'm tracing here, it was repaired with resin, the original Barnista Pasto resin also. In order to make this design and working quickly while the sheets were still elastic, resin sheets were applied to a warm substrate and pricked to prevent the formation of air bubbles. Clear and colored resin shapes were applied to build up the design in relief. The vines, are made of alternating dark and light yellow stripes over metal leaf. The passion fruit flower petals are orange over silver leaf with details rendered in silver under clear resin and shading and other details in black. Each change of color required the inlay of different colors and shapes from pieces of resin. And the whole was covered again with a single sheet to sort of seal it. Some of these layers are as many as 20 layers thick. Surrounding the Kiros's black and gold coat of arms, the 
the inner side of this box is full with local details. There are these two great parrots that flank a basket of tropical uh, fruits against a very busy background of birds, vines, leaves, and tropical berries, including agrath, a local indigenous fruit, which are these ones here, which in fact, when we originally saw this box, we thought were grapes, but we know they're now not. These microscopic details show the complexity of the technique. So this detail here comes from the parrot's, um, the parrot's wing, and this from a leaf on the ins inside of this panel here. This small matte Barney box that dates from about 1650 uh, is the one I showed you earlier. And here the resin sheets are saturated with pigment. The box is covered with a resin sheet of the black ground color. The designs are incised directly into the ground layer and contrasting colored resin threads are inlaid. As in the Briante objects, the designs are likely inspired by European print sources mixed with characteristically South American elements. The decoration on this box is incredibly intricate. And as you can see on the mag magnified details, it, ha it has a hunting motif with a Spanish man on horseback here, a noble woman and a cherub on one side and stags and deer, a hare and a lion, birds and stylized bunches, again of the agras here, uh, which appear on the Brillante Bishop's box. The costumes are consistent with a circa 1650 date. My fascination with these objects stems from how little is known about them, the artisans who made them and the evolution of the techniques. I should point, that, point out also that are far from dying out, there are artists today working in Mexico and Colombia with both decorative traditions, using both traditional and modern materials. So it's a tradition we believe that has, has stretched from the pre-Hispanic times all the way to the present day. With so little surviving from before the Spanish arrival, the skills required to make these objects seems to have emerged fully formed in the early 17th centuries. While we have now done some scientific analysis, these objects are still largely dated by their iconography, a less reliable tool when dealing with design in the Americas where motifs and styles remained popular long after they died out in Europe. We assume that the more accomplished work is closest to the source of the tradition and its pre-Hispanic roots. Both early, ban early Banlista Pasto and Mexican lacquer share the horror vacuous of the Periban Batea that we saw at the beginning, as well as inspiration from 15th and 16th century European sources of illuminated manuscripts. Clear too is the reference to Asian lacquer black grounds with sparkling, vibrant and lustrous decoration. And despite the fact that technically neither of these traditions can be described as lacquer per se. For those of you who are quite rightly wondering why these beautiful objects are not better known, I'd like to finish with a Hispanic society anecdote. You will all remember this batea. It's our early Periban lacquer batea, which, it, which also appears on the bottom left-hand corner of the photo. The Batea actually entered the collection in 1998. And about five years later, when our former director was doing research in our archives, he found this 1924 photo of objects in Arabella Huntington's house. So Arabella Huntington, as some of you may know, was the um, mother of Archer Huntington. And this photograph was taken after her death um, to account for her objects and was with her will. Um, along with bequests to her friends, family and staff, her will stipulated that everything of value uh, that was non-Hispanic went to the Met. Um, everything uh, of value, everything that was Hispanic came to the Hispanic Society. And we know that every last object on this in this photograph was accounted for and recorded with the exception of these four, these bateas at the bottom, which were disposed of. And of course, this one found its way back to us. For me, the significance of this is that even America's most knowledgeable Hispanist at the height of American collecting had not recognized it for what it was. As a conservator, my work and research is informed 
by scientists and science. And so I need to thank the amazing scientists who have helped me with um, my particular fascination. Um, so many thanks to Richard and Michelle and Federica and Elena. And um, also um, my colleagues at the Hispanic Society were always too busy, but we are, they are never too busy to give me a hand when I come to them with uh, these great questions. A museum is as much its collection of objects as it is the extraordinary people who look after them. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you so much, Monica. It was very gracious of you to thank all of your colleagues as well. This was absolutely fascinating. Amazing how much one learned and how much you are, I think, still learning. And you were saying something to me beforehand that you were pursuing another uh, research project on lacquers. Oh, actually, thank you for asking me that, Philippe. Um, yes, I'm actually doing, I'm very excited because we're doing two uh, projects. Um, the first is we're collaborating with the Met um, to identify chia oil. Uh, chia oil, you'll remember, was the oil that they used in Mexican lacquer, um, and they um, they are they believe that it was also used in paintings in Mexico as well. Um, so this is going to be a huge multifaceted project, which is going to in include um, uh, curatorial conservation and scientific departments at the Met. Uh, we are going to analyze um, objects of the Hispanic Society. Um, we are going to be harvesting wild seed. In fact, we already have harvested wild seeds. They're going to be making standards because one of the problems with the research is that there are no standards um, for us to compare against. And um, we are going to be, we're doing this research with the, as well as the, the Met with the um, University of Bordeaux and uh, Wild Cornell Medicine, who are going to be doing DNA analysis of the chia, chia oil. So that's going to be a very exciting um, uh, piece of research. Um, and they're currently, the Met and we're currently in the sort of fund writing phase, phase in the discussion. So, uh, and if anyone has any great ideas, please contact me after the after the talk. And my second project was with Emily Kaplan, um, who is the acting head of conservation at the Smithsonian Institution, the NMAI, um, who has a uh, postdoc fellow Michelle Young working with her and they are be they are doing um, a study on cinnabar identification and sourcing um, they are have going to be looking they've been looking at our objects um, to see where we have use of cinnabar which is a mercury salt uh, pigment that bright orangey red that you see in fact in a lot of um, Asian lacquer as well and uh, because they can do geochemical sourcing and they can tell what mines these pigments have come from and therefore give us some information about where these pigments could be made. So that also is a very exciting project. Well, that's wonderful that you're doing that. And uh, uh, it's a, a excellent demonstration of uh, another aspect of uh, great museums work, which is that uh, they are institutions of higher learning and advanced uh, knowledge uh, about objects that don't merely show them as beautiful things. They do both. Um, I wanted to ask you another question, because as you were showing details of the Vatea and of some of the other objects, uh, the, the, the technique reminded me a little bit of Poisonne enamel. Is there any relationship at all? So, um, yes and no. Uh, yeah, is that is that I think is the correct answer. Yes, in the sense that where you uh, uh, in cloisonne you are creating a, a decorative effect um, by uh, filling areas with different coloured in in most cloisonne we know enamel. Uh, but the technique itself, the Kwasi technique itself, I believe, was originated to 
to hold gems in place because they hadn't worked out how to do that otherwise. And so from that perspective, no, because the pace we're talking about are actually uh, have are tacky, but the removing of the color to inlay others, yes. And it did occur to me also uh, that when, because when I was thinking about cloisonne was that it, uh, the, by the 14th and 15th century, 16th century, certainly, it had died out the use, the, the, constru the use of cloisonne as a decorative technique in Europe, but it had not in China. So it is possible that that was something that the artisans might also be reflecting. I don't know, though, whether any cloisonne was exported uh, early enough for the Chinese cloisonne, but anyway. Well, uh, uh, given given the how elaborate, uh, how complex the whole process of making these objects is, uh, I would I would think they would go into the category of luxury objects, and we're really only made uh, for very wealthy patrons. And uh, would they also have dictated the iconography, for example? Um, so the objects that have survived, I think, were the real luxury objects because they are the ones like our bishop's box that, for example, has a coat of arms on it. That was obviously patron led. Um, and we um, have, in fact, um, acquired another box. Um, in fact, Philippe, if, if I can share my screen again a second, I'll just show it because that let me just share my screen screen and share and let me just go to the end of my whoops where is it here we go this one so this box which was acquired uh, recently uh, this is uh, a box that we know was made for a priest and here is the inscription here and so that was obviously a um, that was obviously put in by the by the patron and because he's a priest here are all the symbols of the uh, cross and so that was also that's obviously also a European elements but in this box you've got these elements here that I think are local. Um, what we do know is that uh, much much later um, chroniclers that went in and the sort of uh, went to Pasto in the uh, 18th century, comment that um, the pasto ware was as beautiful as Chinese as Chinese porcelain, and so you get the sense that it was that the the objects were being produced for everyday use as well as these very high end objects, which were the objects after all that made it. Uh, uh, some of them made them made it back into um, European collections, or uh, and made it. Uh, and so were therefore had been looked after. Well, uh, I'm sure that many of those who are, or many of you who are on the call may have submitted questions or would like to ask questions. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to our audience. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Monica and Philippe. Uh, we did have a question that came in first via email, and that is for Monica. Um, are you aware of any other museums that have discovered that they have lacquer from South America in their collections? Um, actually, yes. Uh, um, actually, the VNA. Um, and um, uh, they had been, they had a, a, a very beautiful box uh, left to them about, ten, I think about 10 years ago. And after I'd seen that box, I said, you know, you should go and have a look in your storerooms. And sure enough, they found, uh, they had, uh, I think they have, I think it's five Periban Batayas, uh, which were down as painted. And um, they also found that they have three gourds from in, three Bernista Pasto gourds, um, which are which were down as metalwork, and I think they're, they're they're I'm almost certain they're not the only ones. In fact, when I give uh, when I talk about lacquer to um, museum professionals, I always tell them to go back to their storerooms and look at all those sort of slightly odd-looking pieces that they that were miss 
misidentified as maybe not good Asian lacquer or, or something else, not because these are not good, but these just don't look like an Asian lacquer piece. If This is um, a very much more vibrant and um, energetic. I like to think of them as being much more energetic decorations on these objects, my own personal taste. Uh, so yes, and in fact, I'm very excited because when we take the Treasures exhibition to London in 2023, I'm hoping to be able to go to the V&A and have them have a look at our objects that will be on our exhibition and be able to look at theirs. Uh, so again, a nice exchange of ideas there. Also going back to London with Treasures is going to be very nice. Wonderful. So, aside from the Victoria and Albert Museum, then our collection is, is among the finest of its kind. Is that, would that be correct? Um, yes, of course. <laughs> no, uh, yes, of course. The Museo de America in Madrid also has some very fine pieces. Um, and But yes, we do have some very fine pieces, yes. Are there any other questions, Christina? Yes, there are a couple more, if that's all right, Monica, and thank you again. One is, um, do you happen to know why most of the artisans remained anonymous? Um, I just, uh, I think it was uh, because they were artisans and not considered artists. Um, and I think that that is true of uh, not just um, in not just in Latin America. I think De La Cerda, who may who decorated the uh, the the cabinet, the Mexican lacquer cabinet, was actually the exception. Um, uh, was actually the exception rather than than the, the other way around. I think it was much more normal for them to be working in workshops. And even now, when you go to Pasto, it's big family workshops with lots of apprentices. And I think that that was that those scenarios um, didn't lend to the naming of specific artists. Thank you. And actually, this is a, a related question since you just mentioned it. Uh, is there any indication in the geographical areas of continuing object production of generation to generation teaching within artisanal families? Almost definitely. I can't name uh, I, I I can't name a single a workshop that that might be. Uh, what that might apply to. But I have to say, when I was in Pasto, um, the, uh, I went to a couple of the workshops that were making modern objects, and there were, uh, the, there were young men who, whose great-grandfathers, they had photographs of their great-grandfathers making Bernista Pasto objects in, you know, sort of uh, 40, 50 years earlier, and they had, they had carried it on, they, they were carrying on the family traditions. So I'm, I assume that that, uh, that must have been um, the case, even in the, well, even in the 17th and 18th century. I just, we just don't know enough, to be honest. We, we, uh, I'm always struggling against this, these, these uh, walls that are, that, that the obstacles are, that we simply don't know enough about these objects, not the techniques. There are some, uh, we have some really sort of some quite enormous questions about how, how these things were still made, although I can, you can see it. How is it possible to make these extraordinarily intricate objects without having a, um, microscope, for example, um, because that some of these objects, that gourd was only 11 centimeters across, which is, you know, this big, and it was very busy. Great. Well, I, I suspect the Julio Mario um, uh, Santo Domingo uh, craft schools in Colombia continue to teach uh, the, the, the craft. And what you're really, in a way, saying is that for the the hordes of tourists in the normal days that would travel to Colombia, Mexico, and elsewhere, uh, the uh, lacquer of this sort would not be the kind of thing that would have been made in sufficient quantity to be a kind of a tourist souvenir, would it? Um, I don't think so, but Humboldt went in 1801, and he talked about 
80 artisans and um, he talked about 80 artisans in Pasto and a production of, I think from memory, it was like between 10 and 15,000 US dollars uh, a year. I mean, it was enormous, some enormous quantities. It felt like that they were producing. I imagine that was for people who were going on these grand tours, but I, again, I mean, now the, the objects that are made in Pasto, I mean, in particular, um, the, Pasto like a Pasto has Bernista Pasto has become has been a um, they made it a sort of part of the national patrimony now uh, last year and uh, so they're making they make objects that are for tourists obviously but then very high end objects uh, even now it's become a, a very high end art form and it's I mean they're beautiful objects not as I mean they use modern pigments now um, and but which is uh, uh, not so nice but not as nice as these, in my opinion, but that's just me. Thank you so much. There more? Um, there was one final question, actually, Monica, since you mentioned pigments, regarding the pigments, I know you had mentioned cinnabar in the research you're conducting. I was wondering if you could mention any other pigments and colorants that were used in these pieces. So in the Bernista Pasto, they used actually um, the the, the really weird thing that they used in Bernista Pasto, I mean, there's a lot of weird things about Bernista Pasto, but the weirdest thing is that they, the whites in the, early, in the early pieces are made of actually another mercury pigment called calomel, which as far as we are aware, um, was used very sparingly in the, um, I think in the 15th century in England on some manuscripts and then nowhere else until these groups of objects were made. And calomel as a mercury, um, as a mercury pigment, it's actually a byproduct of the, of the manufacture of cinnabar. So uh, what is very weird to, our, to all of to us working in the field is how is it that they could, were sophisticated enough to uh, create a white pigment um, from mercury and not use the red? And I, at this point, I don't have the answer, but hopefully um, we will be able to discover more through my the through the analysis that um, Emily and uh, Michelle will be doing at the Smithsonian for us. So um, this is all. I will do another tertulia when we have the answers to these questions, Philippe. Wonderful. Thank you so much again to both of you. Thank you. Well, I, I thought this was really very instructive and and and. Uh, wonderful tertulia, and I want to thank you, uh, Monica, for all the work you are putting into it, and we'll continue to put into it. We're looking forward to the results of your research with your colleagues at the Smithsonian, at the Met, and elsewhere. And I thank all of our members and those of you who have submitted questions uh, as well. Uh, we're thrilled uh, with our community, our supporters, that you continue to stay involved. Uh, with the museum, notwithstanding the fact that we have to meet in this uh, uh, uncongenial way. Uh, our next tertulia will take place on Tuesday, April 6, at 6 p.m., with senior curator of paintings, drawings, and metalwork. You've met him before, Marcus Burke. And he will discuss the work of Pancho Fierro, who was a, uh, a major artist from Peru. So thank you all uh, very much for being with us and look forward to seeing you on the 6th of April at the same time.